Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. At this solemn time of Tisha B'Av, we can take comfort in knowing the Jewish life is once again flourishing amongst its Muslim and Christian brethren in the Gulf. This is the first time in recent years that Tisha B'Av has been commemorated here in Bahrain. The AGJC family has become a beacon for anyone who needs support in practicing their Jewish faith. So far, our reach has been promising and our intention simply to build upon a loose framework of individual Jews living and working in the Gulf. The AGJC is looking to the future of Jewish life in the Gulf with an empathic antenna to recognize all points of view as valid when they withstand the test of authenticity. Jewish life is not an entity on its own. It thrives alongside its cousins and their culture in a way that gives the Abrahamic Accords a sense of unity. It may well have been the Lord's intention to unite the children of our prophet Abraham in their intelligence, their know-how, and their tenacity. The Gulf will be the ideal reference to prove their awesome strength. Thank you. And now it's a great honor for me to introduce Rabbi Adam Mintz, the, the rabbi of Kilat Reim Auvim, a modern Orthodox community he founded on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. He's also the director of 929 English, a web-based project that promotes the daily study of a chapter of Tanakh and provides an opportunity for English-speaking Jewry around the world to engage in a conversation centered around the daily chapter. In addition, Rabbi Mintz is a member of the Talmud faculty at, Yeshiva, at Yeshivat Maharat and has taught as an adjunct assistant professor at City College, New York, for the past six years. Rabbi Mintz received his rabbinical ordination at Yeshiva University, where he received smicha. He obtained his PhD in Jewish history at New York University, where he wrote a dissertation on the topic Halakha in America, the history of city Eruvin from 1894 to 1962. He is married to Sharon, and they have three children, Noam, Ariel, and Shoshana. I know Rabbi means quite a long time when we were very young, and it's really a great honor for me to ask him now to speak about the history and the related laws of, uh, of Tisha B'Av. Please, Rabbi Mintz. Thank you, Alex. Thank you um, for the warm introduction. It's an honor to be able to be part of this Tisha B'Av commemoration in the Gulf. Thank you, Rabbi Abadi, for all that you do and for including me in this commemoration. Tisha B'Av, is a difficult day in the Jewish calendar. It's not a day when we greet people. It's not a day when we say hello even. But at this point, as I look upon the screen and I know about the many, many people who are part of this webinar, I feel very much part of the wonderful community in the Gulf. And it's an honor to be able to share some thoughts about Tisha B'Av and to understand that the wonderful Midrash teaches us that on the day that the temple was destroyed, the Mashiach, the Messiah will be born, that all good things will come even from a day such as Tisha B'Av. Now let's try to look at, evaluate for a little while, the history of Tisha B'Av. We know Tisha B'Av is the day in which the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. But actually the rabbis in the Talmud teach us that the history of Tisha B'Av goes back many hundreds of years before the destruction of the temple. Says, say the rabbis that when the, when the spies came back from spying the land of Israel, came back with a report that should have been a positive report about the land, says they came back with a negative report. Vayivku ha'am ba'laylahahu. And the people cried on that night. They cried for no reason because they should have trusted God. 
says the Talmud, Atem bechitem bechiyashel chinam. You cried for no reason. Ani kovei alachem bechiyalidorot. I'm going to give you a reason to cry. And therefore, Tisha B'Av is, according to tradition, the saddest day on the Jewish calendar. And I want to try to understand that. What does it mean that it's the saddest day on the Jewish calendar? In a sense, a punishment for the fact that the Jews didn't listen to the, good, to the two good spies, to Joshua and to Caleb but instead listen to the 10 bad spies. The Mishnah teaches us, the Mishnah, the rabbinic teaching of the second century CE teaches us that there were several things that took place on this day of the ninth of Av. First is that the two temples were destroyed. And this requires just a little bit of evaluation. The first temple was destroyed in the year 586 BCE by the Babylonians. The prophets tell us the story. The story is told that the Babylonians entered the temple, entered Jerusalem on the seventh day of the month of Av. They fought in the temple for two days. They lit the temple a fire, a flame, on the afternoon of the ninth of Av, today, Tisha B'Av. And the flames lasted through the tenth of the month of Av. That was the destruction of the first temple. And that's historical in the Jewish religion. Historical in the sense that it's found in the holy books, in the holy Bible. The rabbis teach us that not only was the first temple destroyed on the ninth of Av, but the second temple was also destroyed on the ninth of Av. Here, the traditions are a little murky. We don't quite have an official tradition about when the temple was destroyed. There is a tradition that on the 9th of Av, in the year 70 CE, some people say AD, the Romans entered the temple and they burned the temple to the ground. Some, including Josephus, want to say that it wasn't the Romans that burnt the temple, the Jews themselves in some inner fighting actually were the ones who put the flame to the temple. But what's interesting here about the tradition that the second temple was destroyed on the ninth of Av is the fact that the Talmud doesn't give us any historical data about this destruction of the Talmud, of the temple, sorry. It just tells us Mesorahi. It's a tradition that the temple was destroyed on the ninth of Av, that the second temple was destroyed. Misorahi, it's a tradition. What does that mean, it's a tradition? I'll tell you that Josephus, the great Jewish historian of the first century CE, he thinks the temple was destroyed around the ninth of Av, but not actually on the ninth of Av. What is that tradition? that the temple was destroyed on the ninth of Av. And here I think we begin to identify what's special about this day that we're observing and we're fasting on today. And that is that there is a there is this historical data that the first temple is destroyed on the ninth of Av. <laughs> the second temple though, there is no historical data. It's a Masorah, it's a tradition. What's the tradition? The tradition is that all bad things happen on the ninth of Av. You cried for no reason. I'm going to give you a reason to cry. The second temple was destroyed. I don't know it from data. I know it because that's the tradition. And tradition sometimes is stronger even than fact. That idea that the tradition of the ninth of Av, that bad things happen, isn't even limited to the destruction of the temple. According to some historians, the Jews were expelled from Spain in the year 1290. That actually is a historical fact. But when exactly in the year 1290 were they, were they expelled? According to some, they were expelled on the 9th of Av. The Jews were expelled from, from France in 1395. 
once again seems to be they were expelled on the ninth of Av. But most interesting of all is the tradition that the expulsion from Spain in 1492 took place on the ninth of Av. Now, that's a famous tradition. The famous tradition is that Spain was the most important Jewish community in the medieval period. And then in, then in 1469, Ferdinand and Isabella joined, the, um, joined Spain into what we today consider the country of Spain. And they eventually decided to expel the Jews from Spain. When was that expulsion? We know from the history books that that expulsion took place on July 31st, 1492. If you check your calendars, your, you can Google it, to see that July 31st, 1492 actually turned out to be the seventh day of this month of Av. Not the ninth day of this month of Av, but the seventh day of this month of Av. And it seems that the Jews were expelled from Spain on the seventh day of the month of Av. The most important Jew in Spain during the expulsion from Spain was someone by the name of Don Yitzchak Abarbanel. The Abarbanel was a great biblical commentator. He was a politician. He was a diplomat. And he left with the Jews on July 31st, 1492. What's fascinating is that in his introduction, the Abarbanel writes that he was expelled from Spain on Tisha B'Av. Now, he lived through the expulsion. He knew when the expulsion took place. The expulsion took place on July 31st, 1492. That wasn't the ninth day of Av. That was the seventh day of Av. Why does Abarbanel refer to it as the ninth day of Iv? Why does he say that this was my Tisha B'av? And I think here we understand the point that I really want to emphasize today. And that is Tisha B'av is not only a date. Tisha B'av is an idea. The idea is that all bad things happen to the Jews on Tisha B'av, on this day of the ninth of Av. And maybe the expulsion from Spain didn't quite exactly take place on the 9th of Av, but it was close enough. The idea of the expulsion took place on the 9th of Av. And here I want to share with you an amazing explanation that's given by a professor who was a professor here in New York. He was a professor at Harvard. And then he was the head of the Jewish Studies Department in Columbia, in Columbia University. His name was Professor Yosef Chaim Yerushal. And he wrote a book. The book that he wrote is called Zachar. Zachar is a famous word in Hebrew. The word Zachar means to remember. And Yerushalmi's book is all about Jewish memory. And Yerushalmi argues in this book that in Judaism, at least until the pretty modern period, Jewish history wasn't interested in the facts, in exactly how things happened. What Judaism was interested was in Jewish memory. Jewish memory is how we remember the way things happen and the significance of how we remember them. And Yerushalmi uses Tisha B'av as the perfect example. Tisha B'av is an idea. Tisha B'av is the worst day in the Jewish calendar. You cried for no reason. I'm going to give you a reason to cry. And all of these bad things took place on Tisha B'av. The two temples were destroyed. Were they really both destroyed on Tisha B'av? The answer is it doesn't really matter. The first temple was destroyed on Tisha B'av. The second temple was destroyed on a date that's close enough to Tisha B'av that makes it Tisha B'av. The Jews are expelled from Spain on Tisha B'av, July 31st, 1492. Were they really expe expe expelled on Tisha B'av? Was July 31st, 1492 really Tisha B'av? 
Well, the answer is um, the answer is that um, um, that it was close enough. Alex asked me an amazing question. I have to come back next year, Alex, because so there's not enough time to deal with your question. Alex asked the following question. The first temple is destroyed on the 9th of Av, 586. 70 years later, the Jews build another temple. And the temple stands for 400 years. Did the Jews fast during the time when the second temple stood? It's a huge debate. According to many, they fasted during the time of the second temple because the second temple wasn't as, it wasn't as beautiful. It wasn't as ornate. It wasn't as special as the first temple. But it's a great question. So the Jews are expelled from Spain, but it's an idea. They're expelled from Spain on Tisha B'Av. I don't know what the exact date was, but Tisha B'Av is that terrible day of the year. Tisha B'Av is the day when I, we cried for no reason. And therefore, God gives us a reason to cry. And Professor Yerushalmi explains, and I think this is the clincher of the whole thing, says, why is that so important that all bad things happen on Tisha B'Av? And he gives two explanations. One reason is because in Judaism, just like there are certain days that are specially happy days, days in which we celebrate together, and everybody celebrates, so too there are days that are sad days and we all mourn together and we come together to mourn. And the more bad things that happened on that day, the worse the mourning is. Tisha B'Av is a really bad day because all of these terrible things happened on Tisha B'Av. Did they really happen on Tisha B'Av? Close enough. But the idea of all these things happened on Tisha B'Av. And therefore, we mourn on Tisha B'Av. It's a really sad day. But the second explanation given by Professor Yerushalmi maybe is even more profound than that. He said, think, and you're in the Gulf, so you're not thinking about this, but think about the Jews in Eastern Europe. Jews in Eastern Europe who, unfortunately, Poland especially, there were pogroms. Pogroms were attacks against the Jews. In the 1700s, the 1800s, the early 1900s. There were attacks against the Jews all the time. And they used to fast as a commemoration of these attacks. Jews were killed. They used to fast. And basically, Jews were fasting all the time because there were pogroms all the time. And Professor Yerushalmi says that's a bad thing. It's a bad thing to be mourning all the time. It's a bad thing to be commemorating sad things all the time. What we need is we need to pull all of the bad things into one compartment. And we need to say there's one day that's going to commemorate all of these bad things that happen. And that day is Tisha. But what does that do for the rest of the year? That frees up the rest of the year. Yes, today is a very, very bad day. But as we eat tonight and tomorrow morning, as we come out of the nine days and we begin to celebrate again and to live a normal life, Tisha B'Av is behind us. And we won't have to think and worry about Tisha B'Av and all the terrible things that happened for an entire year. So actually, Tisha B'Av is a very sad day. We cried for no reason, and therefore God punishes us and gives us a reason to cry. But as bad as Tisha B'Av is, as, as, as tragic as the things that took place on Tisha B'Av and around Tisha B'Av are, we remember the fact that it's only Tisha B'Av. And that, thank God, we have a wonderful year ahead. And in a sense, Tisha B'Av, in all its tragedy, is something that gives way to a year of pr productivity, to a year of success, to a year of happiness. And while it's still Tisha B'Av, I want to wish everybody that the same way that we mourn today on Tisha B'Av, the same way that we really feel badly about what happened, that we read the book of Eicha, that we read the keynote, that we really mourn the terrible things that happened, at the same time, we realize that this frees us up for a year that I know is going to be a year of tremendous productivity and success for the Jews of the Gulf region and for all of us. And that may 
Tisha B'Av, as the rabbis teach us, turn into a day of festivity and celebration. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Rabbi Mintz, for your insights on the history and halakha of the key part of Tisha B'Av. Sorry, I'm still trying to connect the video. It's not connecting. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Rabbi Dr. Eli Abadi. Rabbi Abadi joined the Jewish Council of the Emirates in 2020 as a senior and resident rabbi. He became the rabbi of the Association of Gulf Jewish Communities upon its creation in February of 2021. He oversees the Arabian Kusher. He oversees the Arabian Kusher Certification Agency and serves as the Afbethim, which are both under the umbrella of the AJJC. Following Rabbi Abadi's rendition of Icha, there will be a question and answer session. Please submit your questions in the question and answer chat and note who your question is for. Rabbi Abadi and Rabbi Mintz will address them in the time that we have left. Thank you so much. Rabbi Abadi, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Huda, and thank you, uh, Rabbi Mintz, for the inspiring uh, presentation. I'm going to be reading uh, the what we know what's called in Hebrew Megillat Echa, or the Scroll of Echa, or the Book of Lamentation as it is known. A lamentation, as you know, it's the word saying that where we lament something, we are sorry about something, and we write about it. And that's exactly what the Scroll of Lamentation or the Scroll of Echa speaks about. It is believed to have been written and authored by the prophet Yirmeya, who lived prior, during, and after the destruction of the first temple around the year 586. And it is believed that he wrote that uh, book, that scroll, around that time as he witnessed all what was happening in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, how the city became desolate, how the people were being uh, killed, uh, exiled, persecuted, and how the unfortunate uh, fate of such a beautiful city as Jerusalem, the city of gold as it was known, um, faced uh, its tragic end. The book uh, of Lamentation consists of five um, uh, chapters. Uh, uh, the first uh, four chapters um, use what's known as the acrostics. Uh, these are the alphabet of the, the Hebrew alphabet, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet from Aleph to Tav. Uh, but interestingly enough, also chapter one, two, and four each have 22 verses uh, corresponding to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The last, uh, the last chapter, chapter five, uh, has uh, 22 lines actually, and uh, does not follow the acrostic. The chapter three is a very uh, interesting one. It follows the acrostics, but each acrostic uses three verses. So the Aleph is repeated three times, the Bet is repeated three times, all the way to the, the, the last letter. Uh, the name Echa comes from the word Ech or How, How. And it's only because the book begins with that word Echa Yasheva Badad, How or How Come uh, this beautiful city is now sitting alone um, and uh, desolate. Uh, but interestingly enough, our sages explain that um, the word Echa comes also from the word Ayeka which is written the same thing, Aleph, Yot, Kaf, Hei, Ayeka. That's the word that, uh, that God asked Adam when he was hiding from him after uh, eating from the forbidden fruit. And he asked him, Ayeka, where are you? And so Echa basically uh, is that word of the, of the beginning of the, of the book, of the scroll, which is the same word that Moshe uses uh, which is in the parasha of this Shabbat that we read, Shabbat Devarim, which is always uh, scheduled to, to be read the Shabbat before uh, Tisha B'Av, because of that word Echa, as Moshe asked, how I'm going to be able to carry all your burdens. And so Echa asks from all of us, how? How come we have arrived to such a point how we have done such things, and indeed to explain our actions in front of the Almighty. 
and this uh, scroll, this book, asks all the why and hows of the Israelites at that time, the Jews, as they saw their city destroyed and saw their people being exiled. And now I begin the reading. I'm going to be reading the first, uh, par the first chapter and the last chapter of Echa. Echa ya shibabadad hai rabati am haeta ke almana rabati bagoim sarati ba medinot haeta lamas bako tifke balaila bedimata alehia. In la menahe mi kol o haveha, kol reaeha bagduba hayula le o yevim, galeta yehuda meoni o meov aboda, hi asheba bagoim, lo ma se amanoah, kol hodefea isiguha ben hamesarim. דרכי ציון אבלות מבלי באמועד כל שעריה שוממים כהניה נאנחים בתולותיה נורות והיא מרלה היו שריה לראש אויביה שלו כי אדוני הוגה על רוב פשעיה עול עליה, הלכו שבי לפני שר, ויסא מבציון כל הדרה, היו שריה כאיילים, לא מסעו מרעם, ולכו בלא כוח לפני רודף, זכר הירושלים, ימי עוניה ומרודיה, כל מחמודיה. אשר היו מימי קדם, בנפול עמה ביצר, ואין עוזר לה, ראו השרים, שחקו על משפטיה, חטא חטאה ירושלים, על כן לנידה הייתה, כל מכבדיה הזילוה, כי ראו ערוותה, גם היא נאנחה, ותה שוב אחור, טומאתה בשוליה, לא זכרה אחריתה, בתרת פלאים, אין מנחם לה, ראה אדוני את עוני כי הגדיל אויב, ידו פרס שר על כל מחמדיה, כי ראתה גויים באו מקדשה, אשר סביתה לא יבואו בקהל לך. כל עמה נאנחים מבקשים לחם, נתנו מחמדיהם, ואוכל להשיב נפש, ראה אדוני ואביתה, כי הייתי זוללה. לא עליכם כל עוברי דרך, הביטו וראו, מי יש מכאוב כמכאובי, אשר עולל לי. אשר הוגה אדוני ביום חרון אפו ממרום שלח אש בעצמותי וירדנה פרס רשת לרגלי השיבני אחור נתנה אני שוממה כל היום דבה נזכת עול פשעי בידו הסתרגו עלו על סברי הרשיל כוחי, נתנני אדוני בידי לא אוכל קום, סילה כל אבירי, אדוני בקרבי, קרע עלי, מועד לשבור בחורי, גת דרך אדוני לבתולת בת יהודה. על אלה אני בוכיה, עיני, עיני אור דמיים, כי רחק ממני מנחם משיב נפשי. היו בניי שוממים כי גבר אויב, פרס הסיון בידיה, 
אין מנחם לשיבה אדוני ליעקב סביביו שרה הייתה ירושלים לנדע ביניהם צדיק הוא אדוני כפי הוא מריתי שמונה כל העמים ורומח רובי בתולותי ובחורי הלכו בשבי קראתי למה הבי הם הרימוני כהני וזקני בעיר גבעו כי ביקשו אוכל למו וישיבו את נפשם ראה אדוני כי שרני מעי חומר מרו נפח ליבי בקרבי כי מרו מריתי מחושק אל החרב בבית כמוות שמעו כי נאנחה אני אין מנחם לי כל אוהביי שמעו רעתי ששו כי אתה עשית הבאת יום קראת ויהיו חמוני תבוא כל רעתם לפניך ועולה ללמו כאשר עוללת לי על כל פשעי כי רבות אנחותי וליבי דבי And now we move to the last paragraph, which is a shorter one, last chapter. And as you see, if you can see me, the custom is to read the Megillat Echa while we are sitting on the floor in a sign, uh, as a sign of, of mourning. And so here I am sitting on the floor as uh, we read this, uh, this chapter, chapter five. זכור אדוני מהיה לנו, הביט האור את חרפתנו, נחלתנו נהפכה לזרים, בתינו לנוכרים. יתומים היינו ואין אבימותינו כאלמנות, ממנו בכסף שתינו, עשינו במחיר יבואו. על צווארנו נרדפנו, יבענו ולא הוא נחלנו, מצרים נתנו יד אשור לסבוע לחם, אבותינו חטאו ואינם, ואנחנו עוונותיהם סבלנו, עבדים משלו בנו, פורק אין מידם, בנפשנו נביא לחמנו, ופני חרב המדבר. עורנו כתנור נכמר ומפני זרעפות רעב נשים בציון עינו בתולות בערי יהודה שרים באדם נתלו פני זקנים לא נדרו בחורים תיכון נשאו נערים בעז כשלו זקנים משער שבת ובחורים מנרינתם שבת משוש ליבנו נפח לאבל מחולנו נפלה עטרת ראשנו אוינה לנו כי חטאנו על זה היה דווה ליבנו על אלה חשכו עינינו על הר ציון ששמם שועלים הלכו בו אתה אדוני לעולם תשב כסחה לדור ודור למה לנסח תשכחנו תעזבנו לאורך ימים השבנו אדוני אליך ונשובה חדש ימינו כקדם כי אם מאוס מאסתנו חשפת עלינו עד מאוד השיבנו אדוני אליך ונשובה חדש ימינו כקדם. And we conclude this way, the scroll of Echa, the last paragraph is a paragraph of hope, paragraph looking to the future, asking God that if our forefathers have transgressed, why should we pay for their sins and transgression, that we have suffered long enough, that God should not forget us forever, and should not abandon us to, for a long time, that he should return to us and help us return to him. And that's how we conclude the paragraph. Hashivenu Adonai Elecha Venashuva. Return us, O God, to you, so we could return. Hadesh Yamenu Kekedem. Renew our days like the days of old, that we had the good old days. And so we pray and hope in this day that indeed it will be in our time that we could renew those beautiful days of old. Tisku ben Hamad Siyon, as the official greeting on a day like this is, may you merit the consolation of Zion. 
Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Abadi, for your rendition of the Echa. And sorry about the technical problems we had before, but we're back to working now. Um, so the first question we have is for Rabbi Mintz. When the Romans attacked the second temple, they were ruthless in their attack, and the priests in the temple were equally ruthless in defending the inner house of the temple. The question is, when you know the cause is hopeless, is it better to save your life or throw yourself in the fire? Such a good question. Thank you so much for your question. The Jews at the time of the Romans had a big problem. Here we are, it's the first century CE. The Romans control that entire region. They call it Roman Palestine. And the Jews weren't quite sure what to do. It's not different than politics today. The Jews had a choice. The Jews could have um, basically agreed to surrender to the Romans to become one with the Romans, to let the Romans control the temple, to turn the temple into a Roman temple, to turn Jerusalem into a Roman city. And then they would live basically as, as part of the Roman empire. The other view was, no, we need to fight it to the end. And what's so tragic actually, is that the Jews argued among themselves what to do. Some Jews thought that we should just give in to the Romans. It'll be better that way. At least we'll survive. And some said, no, we have to fight to the end. And the Jews were fighting not only with the Romans, they were fighting with one another. So the question is, should you jump in? You know, they didn't know the answer then. And we're still not sure of the answer today. But a very, very good question. Thank you, Rabbi Mintz. Uh, the next question is for Rabbi Abadi. What are the differences between the fast of Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur? Well, uh, of course, it appears to be that Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av are, are similar fasts because we both, on both of them, we begin from the day before at, uh, at sunset and we end at nightfall of the next day. So Tisha B'Av and Kippur, in that sense, they are similar. Uh, also, the prohibitions of, uh, of those days, the five prohibition, right? No eating, no drinking, no, no uh, anointing ourselves with, with, with uh, good fragrances um, and no wearing uh, leather shoes and no, no having marital relations. So those are the similarities between both of them. However, the differences is, are uh, first that Yom Kippur uh, is biblically mandated. It's a holiday, it's a fast that the Torah itself speaks about it, where Tisha B'Av, it's rabbinically mandated. It's not, the Torah does not speak about it. It's only during the prophets, as we, we, we learn from Jeremiah, that, uh, that that day and later on, the sages instituted that day to commemorate. Uh, and so therefore, uh, these, are the, these are the differences. The other differences are, that uh, of course Yom Kippur is a day of atonement of our sins and transgressions for the previous year, um, where, uh, where Tisha B'Av is not indeed a day of atonement, but a day of commemoration of such destruction and the exile of, uh, of our people uh, twice, as Rabbi Mintz mentioned, uh, the first temple and the second temple. Um, also, also, uh, on, on Yom Kippur, of course, we, we because it's a day of atonement, uh, it is customary to wear white uh, uh, during prayer time, or at least the whole day, in a sense, as a, as a symbol of our purity, the purity of our soul, despite all the transgressions that we had the year before, but we wear white in that, uh, in that um, uh, symbolic uh, gesture. On Tisha B'Av, we, we don't wear white uh, at all. Some people may wear, may wear black as it is customary in the Middle East as a sign of mourning. So these are the basic uh, differences and, and similarities 
and uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, these days have. Also, Yom Kippur, as you know, it's a what's known as a Yom Tov, believe it or not, which means it is like Shabbat. It's known as a Shabbat Shabbaton. It's a Shabbat. We're not allowed to work. We're not allowed to 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 uh, to to uh, make fire, uh, like a regular Shabbat. Where on Tisha B'Av is not a day like that. In Tisha B'Av, we we can ride on the car. We could uh, write. We could make fire. It's not considered a Yom Tov. Although our sages tell us that La Atid Lavo in the future, as Megillat Echa says. Kara alai moed that God, in a sense, uh, 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 called this day a moed, a moed which could be understood as a as a date, but also in rabbinic and biblical uh, terminology, moed is a holiday. That we hope and pray that in the future, Tisha B'Av will become a holiday of redemption and a holiday of celebration. Um, thank you, Rabbi Badi, uh, Rabbi Mintz. Uh, did the Romans choose the date to coincide with the date of the first destruction? That's also, you, you ask great questions. The answer is no, or we don't know that to be such. But it is very coincidental, right? How could it be of all the days of the whole year that they choose the same day, the 9th of Av, to destroy the temple? It, that's back to what I discussed before, the difference between Jewish history and Jewish memory. In today's world, in the modern period, everything's about history. The chances that the same exact event is gonna take place on the same day in the calendar, the fact that the first world war would start on the exact same day as the second world war seems absolutely impossible because we're interested in the facts. And the facts are, what are the chances that 365 days a year, what are the chances that they'll both start on the same day? But when you talk about Jewish memory, it's not so much about whether it actually happened then. It happened in that time period. And the way we look at it is that it happened on exactly the same day, because that makes this day so much worse. If you can imagine two temples destroyed on the same day, wow, this is really a terrible day. This is really a day of mourning. So in Jewish memory, the answer is yes, it took place on the same day. In Jewish history, somehow that wasn't a factor for these Jews yet. If I may add, if I may add a few other uh, historical uh, events and tragedies that occurred during this month, believed to be the, that occurred during the day of, of Tisha B'Av. First was the first crusade in the year 1095 that killed 10,000 Jews, uh, believed to be also around this day. Also the expulsion of the Jews from England in the year 1290 believed to be around the, the Tisha B'Av time. And we already, Rabbi Mintz already spoke about the expulsion from Spain, but also be, the believe the beginning of World War I in the year 1914 may have began also around this date. The deportation from the Warsaw Ghetto to the Treblinka concentration camp is believed to have taken place on Tisha B'Av in 1942. And the most recent thing was the bombing of the AMIA building, the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires, also took place on Tish Abe'av, uh, where 86 people were killed. And so, uh, as you, uh, as Rabbi Mintz mentioned, as our sages mentioned on the Midrash, that that date, unfortunately, uh, uh, has been set for infamy, as it began with the spies and a appears to be continuing to be a day of unfortunate tragedies and calamities to the Jewish people. Thank you, Rabbi Abadi. Let's hope those are the last ones and we don't have any more to add. Um, a question for you, Rabbi Abadi. Is the main reason for the destruction of the temples because of people not respecting each other? If yes, what is the connection with the spies in the desert? Well, uh, yes, although our sages do say in the, in the Midrash and in the Talmud that because of sinat chinam, because of baseless hatred, that we did not love each other freely, so to speak, that the, that the temple was destroyed. And uh, indeed, that might have been a main reason. 
However, as you know, when people don't love each other, when there is no free love in a sense that we don't love uh, our fellow uh, Jew and, and try to help them in whatever they're suffering, then from there, all the rest of our actions continue. And so if we don't love somebody, we don't help them. If we don't help them, we let them suffer. If we let them suffer, we, we, we might, uh, uh, we might uh, cheat on them or steal from them or not care about their welfare. And so in a sense, everything comes from loving each other. But if we don't, all of our actions, unfortunately, become negative actions. And so when you, when you compound all of those things together, you create a society that is not at peace, a society that is not uh, friendly with each other, a society that is antagonistic to each other. And that's what really may have caused the, the, the destruction and, and the exile. What's the connection with the spies? Well, uh, in a sense, uh, the spies uh, first and foremost demonstrated a lack of faith in the Almighty. And uh, the lack of faith of the Almighty led them to uh, interpret what they saw in a negative way as to we are unable. They felt that they were unable to conquer the land that God has given them. And that's a lack of faith because God told them, I will fight for you. I will make you, I'll give you that land. If they are doubting the ability, that means they're doubting the ability of God and the faith of God. So in a similar fashion, when we don't love our fellow Jew, when we don't do help our fellow, uh, it shows also a lack of, of faith. Why? Because God has told us, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so if we violate that, it's as though we are lacking in faith, uh, faith in God. And so in a similar fashion, as I said, but they didn't despise, they did not respect each other. They did not have faith in God. And also in the destruction of the second temple, I would say in the first temple too, that lack of faith in the Almighty was, was present and permeated, unfortunately. Um, one, another question for Rabbi Mintz. If Tisha B'Av is the only bad day of the year, why do we fast before Purim and the day after Rosh Hashanah? Good. Actually, there are a few other days that joined in that. And that is in the middle of the winter, we have a fast called the 10th day of Tevet. And also the day after Rosh Hashanah, we have the fast of Gedalia. Those fasts are all connected to the destruction of the temple. They all are events that either led to the destruction of the temple or events that took place right after the destruction of the temple. So actually, Tisha B'Av is the highlight fast of temple destruction fasts. And then we have other fast days that connect to that. I would say that there are two exceptions to that rule, as Rabbi Abadi spoke about. Number one is Kippur. Obviously, Kippur is a completely different kind of fast. It's a fast of atonement. It's not related to commemoration in the sense of the destruction of the temple. The other, which is an interesting fast, is the fast of Esther, which takes place on the day before Purim. And that's a fast, nothing to do with the destruction of the temple. But Esther, before she went to the king, she fasted as a way of prayer. You see, fasting, let me just say this for one second. Fasting is an interesting thing. Why do you fast? Especially for those of you in the Gulf who, for whom the fast is almost over. You say to yourself, it's a long day. Why do you bother fasting the whole day? Wouldn't it have been easier to do something else? We could go to synagogue. We could, you know, maybe skip lunch, but have breakfast. There are so many different ways to do it. The idea of not eating, as our body said, from sunset the night before to nightfall the following day in the tremendous heat of the summer seems a little upset, you know, excessive, I think. And I think the answer is, and this is a very important idea, the idea of fasting is connected to the idea of prayer, that we fast as a sense of a prayer, of inner searching of our soul. The fact that you don't feel well when you fast means that you think about what life is really all about. Why was the temple destroyed? What did we do wrong? Why is it that we commemorate a destruction of Jerusalem every single year? 
And I think that idea, the idea that fasting and prayer are connected to one another really helps us appreciate why fasting is such a relevant reaction and response to the destruction of the temple. Thank you, Rabbi Mintz. And the last short question to Rabbi Abadi. Are we allowed to smoke on Tisha B'Av? Well, the question is, are we allowed to smoke any time uh, of the year, any day <laughs> of the year, given our responsibility to our health? Uh, and so therefore, I would say uh, from health-wise, a person should never smoke, not on Tisha B'Av and on any, any regular day. But from a halachic point of view, smoking is not considered eating. And some sages do allow smoking on Tisha B'Av. However, others don't because uh, if smoking is a source of, uh, of enjoyment for the person, a, 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 a source of pleasure, then a person should also abstain from smoking on, on Tisha B'Av. Does that apply to vaping as well? Is that considered the same? It would be the same thing, correct. Same thing. Okay, thank you, Rabbi Abadi. Thank you, Rabbi Mintz. And wishing you all an easy and meaningful fast. And back to Alex. Thank you, Rabbi Abadi. I, we should not have asked that question about smoking to Rabbi Abadi as a doctor. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Mintz, also. It's amazing. It's also always a great pleasure to hear you speaking. Uh, I think like Rabbi Abadi said, after the reading of Echa, there is no better way to close uh, the reading of Echa and uh, uh, even this webinar the same way that we uh, close the reading of, uh, of the Megillah. So I would like to repeat that Pasuk. Ashiveinu Adonai Elecha Venashuva Chadesh Yameinu Kekedem Restore us to you, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew all days as of old. For those who would like to be updated on the AGJC event and resources, please follow us on Twitter at Gulf Jewish or visit our website at www.gulfjewish.org and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter. I wish you all, especially those in America, for us it's gonna be shorter, to have an easy fast and a meaningful fast. Good evening and thank you for joining.